Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to our uh, Applied Algebra Seminar. Uh, today, we'll be having uh, Wen Chun Po from UC Davis talking to us about a crystal uh, for stable growth and leak polynomials. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in chat, uh, and I can uh, relay them to Wen Chun, or if you want, you can always uh, just ask Wen Chun. Uh, remember that this time we'll be doing a little five-minute pause in the middle uh, just to see how taking a break in the middle helps with have like the fatigue that happens at Zoom that are when they're way too long. Uh, so anyway, um, I will then let it go to Enshin. Uh Have a good talk. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you again to the organizers for um, inviting me today. Um, to, I'll be talking about a crystal for stable growthic polynomials, which is joint work with uh, Jennifer Morse, Jenping Pan, and uh, my advisor, Alan Schilling. So um, let's probably begin. Um, hang on. Oops. First um, technical problem of the day. I so need to. Uh, I can't seem to move between slides. Okay, now it works. All right, let's start with um, two motivating questions for today. And, and this is coming from um, uh, enumerative geometry, where um, one setting, you have partitions, lambda and mu. And then if you consider Shub, uh, the Grassmannian uh, and look at the Kolmogy ring, um, there are these Schubert classes, which are indexed by these partitions. And uh, they form a basis, so it makes sense to sort of multiply these classes together and expand them as a linear combination in terms of um, the other classes. And then one wonders um, how to actually determine these so-called structure constants that come that arises from it. And in a similar setting, uh, if you have two permutations u and v, and um, you look at the flag manifold, again um, in the Kolmogorov ring there are the Schubert classes and they're indexed by these permutations. Um, these things also form a basis. And um, again, if you want to, if you multiply these two and expand them again in, into the rest of the Schubert classes, you want to sort of um, be able to explain these uh, structures content, constants yourself. So the nice thing is that um, there, there are some tools to sort of um, help this. And in fact, the first question is very much answered. Um, so there are these so-called polynomial representatives. Um, in the case for the Grassmannians, they are the sure functions. They are indexed by uh, partitions, lambda, mu, and so on. And um, basically, finding the um, structure constants amounts to um, doing the little Richardson rule, which basically tells you how you multiply two sure functions and expand them again in terms of sure functions. And these coefficients um, C super new sub lambda mu, they actually count a certain number of um, semi-standard uh, skew shape tableau of a particular shape, weight, and some sort of property on the reading words. Um, however, um, for the case of um, permutations, we, we, we know that there are polynomial representatives, but um, it's still um, kind of unknown how, how to determine these structure constants. But in, in some sense, um, what we know here is that, you know, if you can sort of assign a polynomial representative, maybe studying these polynomial representatives will help you understand the, const the structure constants in the original picture. So, um, sort of like a recap from what we have just now. Um, in the Grassmannian, uh, the polynomial representatives are the sure functions as lambda, these are indexed by partitions again. For the flag manifold, um, they are the Schubert polynomials, these are indexed by uh, permutations W. And uh, there, there has been uh, quite a bit of study in the K theoretic setting. In this case, uh, the polynomial representatives um, for the Grassmannian and flag manifold are respectively the Grassmannian growth unique function, which are uh, indexed by partitions again. And for the flag manifold, you have the growth unique polynomial. So um, these were studied by, say, the, these were introduced by uh, Lascaux, Schuss, and Berger, and also um, Lascaux um, in the 1980s. And um, for, the for the polynomial representatives in the flag manifold case, they actually um, stabilize 
um, if you sort of uh, shift your permutations long enough and uh, ex and expand them into in terms of monomials, uh, the coefficients will eventually stabilize, and they are then um, called the standing symmetric function for the usual cohomological setting. And for the K-theoretic cohomological setting, um, these growth link polynomials, uh, they stabilize to what is known as a stable growth link polynomial. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, stable growth link polynomials in particular. All right, um, you have seen the word crystal in the title. Maybe you're wondering what it is uh, and why it's important. So why crystals? First, um, they th these were actually disco um, discovered by Kashiura um, in the 1990s. And it sort of serves as a combinatorial way to model tensor representations of classical Lie algebras. There are many other settings where this uh, happens, but we restrict to um, crystals arising from um, representations of classical Lie algebras. Um, the nice feature that they have and they share in common with representations of semi-simple Lie algebras in general is that you have a notion of isomorphism, tensor product, direct sum decomposition, and of course characters. And characters are the one that uh, we are very interested today because um, they correspond to the so-called polynomial representatives that we've seen earlier. So uh, in particular, if we restrict our case to uh, crystal with highest weight lambda, um, we have this uh, well-known uh, tensor product construction for crystals. And uh, if you tensor two crystals with a highest weight lambda mu, you can then again um, decompose them into uh, a direct sum of um, other crystals with highest weight nu with certain coefficients. So there, there is like a special way to count this, and this is known as also as a little, which is a rule. And here, these coefficients, they count the number of highest weight elements that occur in each, uh, in the connected components of um, the tensor power of B lambda and B mu. And in particular, if you look into crystals of type An, wow, um, their characters, as in, in the irreducible um, I mean, those coming from the irreducible representations, they are precisely the show functions. And in this case, um, we by just taking the characters of um, these uh, crystals, which are um, the crystals for the associated irreducible representations, we do recover the uh, multiplication rule that we've seen earlier as the little Richardson rule. Okay, so um, now a little bit more about um, stable growth rate polynomials. So these were introduced by Fumi and Kirill in 1994 in the FIPSEC. Uh, yeah, I think in the papers submitted for FIPSEC. Um, and uh, these polynomials, they specialize to uh, the standing symmetric functions, F sub W, when uh, we set the parameter beta to zero. Uh, and in this, in the particular case for standing symmetric function, uh, Morsch and Schilling has um, actually defined a type AM minus one crystal for that. And uh, for me in green, um, in 1988, proof that uh, each of these stable growth link polynomial, they actually admit a sure positive exponential. What that means is that if you try to um, expand them in terms of uh, sures and you grade them by the powers of beta, which I'll explain later, um, the coefficients are all non-negative and uh, they're all non-negative integers. Uh, and recently, Monica Bocchani and Scrimshaw, uh, they define an induced type A minus one crystal for these uh, stable growth rate polynomials. What that means is that they define a type A M minus one crystal on the associated objects, commutator objects, and um, whose characters give you the stable growth rate polynomials. However, um, it seems that on some cases, they come with non-local changes. And so this sort of, um, us if we can actually do better and find a type AM minus one crystal for a stable growth rate polynomial for any permutation W um, such that you have a local change. So this is the rough idea of uh, what inspired this um, whole project. So um, just to give you an idea of what um, crystals look like, uh, I'm going to restrict the crystal of type AM for the entire of the entirety of the talk. So just to give some recap, um, we, a crystal is determined by uh, a Lie algebra. And for type AN, the associated Lie algebra is uh, GLN. It has a weight lattice um, given by um, the cone span by, uh, I mean, the positive orthon of a ZN plus 
one. And they are indexed by simple roots, um, where these epsilon i minus epsilon i plus one, so these are the uh, ith basis vector minus the i plus um, one basis vector. Um, sorry, my epsilons are kind of um, overloaded today, so I have to use this particular version of epsilon. Anyway. So what exactly is a crystal? Um, in particular, what is a crystal type AN? So it is basically any uh, 90 set B that you can come up with, provided you can meet all these properties. So first, you need to have um, two, map, two um, types of maps for every I, EIs and FI. These are your uh, raising and lowering operators, respectively. And they uh, sort of bring you from one element of a crystal to another or they can actually annihilate that um, element. In that case, we put a zero to it, okay? And uh, we also assign a weight to every particular um, element in B. So it means everything uh, uh, is sent to something to in, on the weight lattice. And um, just for the technical purposes, and this is not so important for today, uh, we impose that uh, there are these string lengths, phi i and epsilon i, given by the maximum number of times that you can apply f i and e i respectively. And um, if, if you happen to know the language of crystal, this, this is basically what makes um, uh, the discussion of crystal today uh, semi-normal crystal. But what is really important um, for, a, for a crystal is that whenever you have uh, that a state x can be lowered to a state x prime by an fi, you can then raise it back using ei, okay? So bear in mind that ei and fi can still kill or annihilate elements in uh, your set b. It's just that we demand that um, whenever you can bring from one uh, element to another, you can uh, reverse it using um, the other crystal operator. And furthermore, when, when you can actually do this, then we also want that your weights to be um, shifted by a simple root uh, alpha i, uh, given whatever crystal operator that you have on fi or ei. Okay, so maybe let's um, see an example of this. So uh, I, I'm going to sort of assume that you know what an integer partition is. And for today, we're, we're going to follow the French notation, which means my boxes are going to be oriented um, to the left and to the bottom. Um, and uh, our shapes here, um, we, we allow them uh, to be skew shaped, which means we can cut off um, the bottom left corner by another partition. So uh, with all this in mind, so take two partitions with um, lambda mu, with mu being contained in uh, the partition lambda. What that means is that if you have um, a partition, you can arrange the boxes um, such that the largest part is uh, at the bottom and then the parts really increase to the top. And the diagram for mu is uh, somewhere within the diagram of lambda if you sort of left justify and bottom justify everything. So um, we call a set value tableau of this particular shape to be a filling of diagram of, of this shape such that um, you have every, instead of um, having um, your boxes to be filled with integers, like what you do for semi-standard Young Tableau, you would fill it with uh, non empty finite sets of positive integers. You can fill it with more than one positive integer, uh, but you cannot leave them empty, okay? And the semi-standardness condition is the following. If you go along rows, um, anytime when you see a box uh, A to the left of B, the maximum A has to be less than or equal to the minimum B. And anytime you go along a column, uh, if there is a box A that is below C, your maximum of A has to be three less than the minimum of C. So that's your um, uh, sort of weakly increasing and strictly increasing condition. Uh, is it possible to have both of these? Oh, um, Good question. Well, th this is not quite the setting that, that we are... Wait, hang on. Maximum B or... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what, what sort of um, thing that would result, but uh, at least for set value tableau, this is not quite the, um, the, the thing we are considering today. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so as an example, um, for 
uh, this tableau T over here. This is a seven tableau. Why? If you sort of uh, look at the, uh, roughly speaking, the sets, the maximum of this is less than equals to the minimum of that, and and similarly for the second row, and for this uh, particular column, you see the maximum here is two, and that's really less than four, and um, I, I know this uh, is a skew shape tableau, so I need to tell you what shape it was. So the simplest shape you can have is a three, two. So as in you have three boxes here and two boxes here, and you remove the one box on the bottom right, uh, bottom left corner. So, uh, and we put, um, and we denote by SVT as the self semi, uh, set value tableau of shape lambda over mu. And if you want to say that it has maximum entry um, up to M, we put a superscript over here. That's the convention. All right. Um, so you, you might be wondering, uh, how, how do we put a crystal structure on this? So this was done by Monica Pacheng and Scrimshaw um, as they were uh, investigating the crystal on uh, for stable growth rate polynomials. So on set value tableau, the weight function um, just assigns a vector whose if component counts the number of i's that appear inside t. So you just count all of that, put them in the respective components, and that's your weight. Um, now, the uh, crystal operators, they usually come with some sort of um, signature or pairing rule. So I need to describe that first. Um, so take your tableau t and um, look, at, look at column by column. If you have only i's but no i plus one, put a minus. If you have a uh, i plus one but no i, you just put a plus. And then um, you do that for every column. You're going to have a bunch of pluses and minuses. Sometimes um, you may not have any because sometimes you, they, you don't have either or you have both. So that's okay. But uh, the thing is you need to get rid of um, adjacent pairs of plus and minus together until um, you don't see such kind of pairs. Okay, now uh, assuming that you, you've done all this, um, that's what is known as an I pairing rule. I'll, I'll show you an example. Uh, for an, uh, to apply FI on T, you look at uh, the cell that contains the rightmost I that is not I paired according to this rule. If there is no such I that exists, then FI annihilates this T. Otherwise, uh, look to the right of that cell and if it contains both i and i plus one, what you do is um, you remove i from that cell on the right and then add it at i plus one into the cell that you are looking at. Um, and if, well, this does not even happen, um, well, what you do is just change this i into an i plus one. And know that if you, if you are familiar with um, uh, the crystal operators for, um, oh yeah, that, that's something I forgot to mention. Uh, in a case where you, your sets are um, singletons. This basically is the definition for semi-standard Young tableau of, uh, uh, of that given shape. Um, and in, in the case where you deal with a semi-standard Young tableau of uh, skew shape in general, uh, you never encounter the second case. So basically this uh, crystal operator reduces to uh, the crystal operator for um, semi-standard Young tableau. And uh, as mentioned before, EIs and FIs, they are like partial inverses. Um, so there, there is like a similar definition of EI, um, where if there is no I plus one, you sort of kill, you sort of annihilate that um, tableau. And otherwise you, you do something uh, that sort of reverses these operations. So um, as an example, uh, if you have this particular um, set value tableau T, then uh, by counting the number of ones, twos, threes, and fours, you see that there's, there are four ones, one, two, uh, two, threes, and one, four. So it's a uh, weight four, one, two, one. And um, how do you do um, F1 or F3 to it? So um, for F1, what you do is you assign a minus to every column that has a one, but no two, and plus for every column that has a two, but no one. So these three columns all receive a minus none of them contains only a two, so there's no pluses here. Um, this particular one uh, has both one and two, so you just um, don't put any sign. And now we look at the cell with the rightmost um, minus here, which is uh, one. And then you, um, so now if you look at this particular cell, the cell to its right has both one and two. 
So in this case, you would want to change, um, you want to sort of remove this one from the right and put a two over here. So that's how F1 operates. On the other hand, uh, if you want to do F3, you do the same exercise, but with threes and fours. So um, those columns that has uh, only threes, but no fours are the first and third column. Uh, column two has only four, so that's a plus, and then um, there's nothing in the last column, so you don't assign anything. Now, this plus and this minus cancels, and then now you look for the rightmost column with a minus, and change that three. Okay, so now the the cell to the to its right does not have both three and four, so that's fine. So you just change the three to a four. So that's how you do an F3. Now, um, sort of an audience participation. Um, what, what do you think of um, F2 on this uh, particular tableau? Two, two, two. You have only a one, two, so you, I ah, know, two and three. Two and three, yeah. yeah. It, it does nothing, because the yeah. twos are the, to, the, to the right, to the left, to the right of threes, yeah. Yes, so there, there's no, um, so if you sort of assign your plus and minus, you have um, a plus, nothing, plus and minus, and the plus and minus cancel. And uh, you, you just need to look for the rightmost minus if that's possible, but in this case, there's none. So um, in this case, F2 uh, annihilates this tableau T. Okay, so um, ho hopefully this, this example helps. And um, if you want to do an exercise, you can try um, doing it on set value tableau. So this is an example for the case of uh, shape uh, two, two, um, take away um, one. And uh, these are the set value tableau where you uh, put exactly one extra letter to it. And um, what, what I'm showing you here is uh, what is known as a crystal graph. So um, the sort of information that you want to extract from a crystal graph is the following. So for every element here, if you see an arrow going down, um, that's an F arrow, and the number next to it is um, the index uh, that it corresponds to. So for example, over here, uh, we have one, two, two, one, that changes to one, two, three, one, um, and this is an F2 operation. But you don't see, oops, sorry, you don't see an arrow um, going uh, inside or out, out of it. So an F1 uh, annihilates uh, this particular, this uh, particular tableau over here. Okay, and um, we don't need to show the E's because uh, as discussed earlier, the F's and E's, they are partial inverses whenever they exist. So uh, a way to read off the E's will be to see whether there are incoming arrows. So in particular, um, the one over here, you can do, uh, the, the one over here, you can do an E2 and E1, but the one over here, you can do neither. Yeah, and also um, there, there are some um, nice notions like uh, precise morphism. And as you can see, um, these two graphs are actually isomorphic. They're um, as labeled directed graphs and um, it is, you, you, ha you have a notion where um, it, uh, you have a map between these two that preserves both the crystal operators and the weight operators. That's, that's roughly what a crystal isomorphism means. Of course, you need a bijection and you need um, the same operators to kill the same um, tableau and so on. So, but this is just a, an illustration of what a crystal graph typically looks like. Okay. Um, now, let, let's go more into um, decreasing factorizations, uh, which are basically the heart of um, how to sort of look at stable graphic polynomials from a combinatorial sense. So um, we have this zero hacker monoid, and you can define it on um, n letters, and uh, it's denoted by h naught n plus 1. Um, if you know the group presentation for the symmetric group, and then you use the adjacent operators as your generators, you can see similar relations over here, uh, except that now the generators here, they are idempotent rather than being their own inverse. They have far commutativity uh, relation and they have this sort of braid relation. And this actually um, 
holds for not just um, adjacent letters, but for all letters. Um, pretty much because of uh, the fact that these things are unimportant. So one thing to remark, um, and I would like to draw um, your attention, is that um, the equivalence classes in here, there's a notion of uh, reduced words and all that. Uh, if you look at the reduced word, which, and, and look at the equivalence classes of these reduced words, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, permutations in SM plus one. So if you think of SM plus one as generated by your um, adjacent transpositions, basically what you do is you send your um, reduce word in uh, the zero hacker monoid to um, the associated um, generators uh, in the symmetric group. And that, that's the correspondence they were talking about. Now, um, in uh, unlike the symmetric group, the zero hacker monoid is actually uh, has uh, infinitely many uh, representatives in a particular Class. Actually, it's true also in um, the symmetric group. But in here, um, we're, we're going to make a decision between words and equivalence classes. So I'm going to use word U um, for that and as a particular representative of the equivalence class. And we also have a notion of uh, equivalence. Uh, uh, that is all the things that you can um, get based on these relations over here uh, for uh, two words, U1 and U2. Sorry, this is a typo. Okay, and we are going to use this notation for the equivalence. Now, uh, in particular, we're going to concentrate more on fully commutative one, simply because they behave more nicely. Uh, we say that a word is fully commutative. If let's say in any of your reduced expressions that you can get from this uh, word U, subject to the relations that we've uh, seen earlier, um, your, you don't actually have a consecutive braid subword of the form i, i plus one i, or i plus one i, i plus one. So as an example, three, one, three, two, that's fully commutative because if you so, uh, try to do the relations uh, in a zero hacker monoid, right? so for example, over here, you can commute the one and three, and then uh, reduce three, three down to three, and then you see that no matter what else you can do, um, these are the shortest words that you can have, and none of them uh, are braid subwords of this form. However, for two on two one, this is not fully commutative, because um, if you try to uh, bring it down to the reduce uh, word representative, you get one to one um, by changing two on two into one to one, and then you reduce one one into one, and one to one and two on two are um, basically breaks up words, and uh, we, we don't want that. So um, this is an example of a non-fully commutative uh, word in your zero hegemonoid. Okay, so uh, now take a reduced expression or reduced word in um, the zero hegemonoid. Now we can talk about decreasing factorizations. So a decreasing factorization for W is basically a product of, uh, into m factors here, uh, where if you think of this as a word, this is equivalent to your reduced word w, and then each factor is either going to be empty or strictly decreasing sequence. And um, because of uh, the fact that your generators, they are idempotent, they, you can have them as long as you like. So in particular, um, there is a notion of a shortest word, uh, so the reduced word, so to speak, and the length of the reduced word is denoted by LW, and we have the excess statistics which counts the number of extra letters that you put um, put in in your decreasing factorization. And um, we say that the decreasing factorization is fully commutative uh, if the associated word for uh, the reduced word for it is also fully commutative, and we denote. Um, the cell of all possible decreasing factorization in M factors as uh, HM star as the following. Now, why is this important? Well, because um, there is actually a combinatorial definition um, of the stable growth rate polynomials uh, using decreasing factorization. So what you do is um, take a permutation W and then associate to a uh, reduce word in the zero hacker monoid. You just uh, sort of take the indices of your generators in the in a reduced expression, 
And then uh, I'll write x to the a as a lazy way of saying um, I'm taking x1 to the a1, x to the a2, and so on, uh, xm to am, where a is a particular uh, integer vector. So uh, we can then define um, the stable graphic polynomial for this reduced expression um, w to be um, the this sort of generating function where uh, you take x um, raised to the weight of uh, h, where h is a decreasing factorization, uh, that is equivalent to w hat in the zero hat monoid. And uh, you count the extra letters and you put that into the power of beta. So basically, this is like sort of a generating function that keeps track of not just the weight, but also um, how many extra letters that you put into your factorization. Um, so last uh, we talked about stuff, it was uh, about a combinatorial definition for stable growth rate polynomials in terms of these decreasing factorizations. So um, think of it again, uh, generate all possible uh, decreasing factorizations that is equivalent to W hat, uh, where W hat is uh, solve the corresponding reduced word in the zero hat monoid for permutation. And then um, you count the x, you take into account the excess, you take into account the weight, and um, that's basically the um, polynomial for you as like a power, power series. So um, what we sort of do is to sort of define a crystal on this, and it has a sort of similar flavor of what you see for set value tableau. So um, as as you, uh, it is as what you think it is for the weight. Um, just uh, collect as vector the i component, uh, where you count um, the number of uh, letters in each vector uh, i, and uh, uh, and that's the size. So um, we uh, we just sort of go from right to left because um, it sort of works with the rest of our insertion and all that. So um, our factors are numbered from uh, right to left, one, one up to M. And uh, if you want to look at the I pairing for this particular decreasing factorization, what you do is you uh, look at the factors I and I plus one alone. And from the factor I plus one, take um, your letter X starting from the largest one uh, and going down to the smallest one. And for each such letter, uh, look for um, the smallest y in the factor i such that y is at least x. If there is such kind of y, then you pair them. Otherwise, uh, leave them unpaired and continue. And by continue, I mean um, now continue pairing, but ignore all um, previously paired um, elements. So as an example, if we have this decreasing factorization h over here, so if you want to look at the one pairing, so you see that um, five would then first pair with six. So now you ignore five and six. Four, um, the smallest um, letter that's greater than it is five. So four pairs with this five. Then three, well, it pairs with the three, which is the same, is equal to it. And then this leaves the two unpaired in this case. Um, so that's the one pairing for H. On the other hand, for two pairing, uh, it's slightly more interesting. So um, seven has nothing to pair because there's nothing uh, on the right that is at least as big as seven. So it is left unpaired. Five pairs with this five. And then one, instead of pair, uh, you then pair with the smallest possible number between four and three, so that's three. And that leaves four unpaired. So that's um, basically the, the pairing procedure for um, your decreasing factorization. Now we, we're gonna use these uh, to actually define the crystal operator. And I'm going to show it you know, for fi. Uh, the one on ei is sort of defined similarly, um, sort of just the reverse. Okay, so for fi, um, you take the largest letter x in the ith factor that is not i paired according to the rule that we've described earlier. If there is no such x, then fi annihilates this h. Otherwise, if let's say x plus one is present in both um, the i and i plus first vector, now um, what you do is you remove instead um, x plus one from the uh, i plus first vector and add that to add x into the um, next vector. I think, oh uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, let me see. Uh, 
Um, I, I think I want to say that this is uh, the I factor of age. Sorry about that. Um, and if there, um, if this case is not possible, now you move um, X from uh, HI plus one and add it to HI. Again, this is a typo. Uh, uh, sorry, from HI to HI plus one. Uh, I think it's probably better if I show this using an example. So for it, uh, over here, again, with the same factorization H, and I've uh, retained the one pairing and two pairing as before. So in the first case, um, <clears throat> the largest unpaired letter in the first factor is this one. Okay, so we, we don't see a two uh, in both of these. So we just uh, remove that one and move it over um, to the second factor. So that's basically uh, this last condition over here. Now for F2, um, what you want to do is uh, you look at the largest uh, letter that is unpaired in the second factor, that's a four. And instead of moving this four, uh, you notice that there are, there are fives on both factors over here. So um, now what you do is remove this five uh, and then you add a four to the third factor. So the, what happens here is that this five goes and changes to a four and then you insert it over there. So that's, uh, th those are the two main rules for the F5 operator. And one can check that these rules actually um, sort of preserve the word and preserve access. So uh, in fact, we've shown that um, this, is actu this actually defines a type A minus one crystal uh, that preserves both access and, and the word that is associated to it. And uh, you can actually arrange it nicely in terms of a crystal. So this over here is an example where um, the reduced word is 132. You have three factors and you have one extra letter in, in each um, factorization. So you have this very nice um, graph over here. So that's, that's really um, the crystal on HM star. And we actually call this the star crystal. Okay, so now uh, we, we like to sort of connect this. Uh, once you sort of discover a new crystal, maybe you, you sort of want to relate it back to a more familiar crystal, let's say with a uh, uh, semi stat young tableau or set value tableau. So in this case, uh, we're going to relate to the set value tableau first. Uh, and this is done by using the so-called residue map. So what you do is you take a set value tableau of a particular skew shape lambda over mu and it'll return to you a uh, decreasing factorization in the following manner. So um, what you do is that you associate each cell with a diagonal and um, rather than going by, by this rule, uh, the easiest way is to sort of do upward sloping diagonal. Um, the, the first box that, that it hits from um, the top left is the first diagonal, the, the next one is the second diagonal and so on. So um, in here uh, you have T, you have diagonal one for three, four, diagonal two for four, five, diagonal three for one, two, and um, diagonal four for the last four, okay? And for each of these diagonals, you, you're going to use them to fill in your factors. So what you do is for every uh, factor K, um, so you scan for all letters K that appears in your tableau T, and um, you then um, read their diagonals or the residues that they come from and arrange and put that in your k factor and arrange them in decreasing order if possible. So for example, in here, uh, if you want to uh, put in the fourth factor, so you look for all possible four, so they're in diagonals one, two, and four. So that's uh, four to one in, in this fourth factor. And you can do the same for the rest. So that's um, how the residue map works. And uh, it is actually a non-trivial thing, but um, one can actually show that if you start with a skew shape tableau, the um, decreasing factorization that you get is actually fully competitive. And um, this more or less happens if and only if that's the case. And furthermore, this resume map is really nice because if you start with any set value tableau of a certain skew shape and you apply the resume map, you get a decreasing factorization, right? So both of these, they have their own uh, crystal operators, Fi. And uh, what we've shown is that um, our 
residue map intertwines these two crystal operators, meaning that if you do the residue map first and then you do the FI operator on decreasing factorization, that's the same as if you do FI on set value tableau and then you do the residue map. So, uh, and in fact, in up to uh, shifts in the skew shape, you can actually show that the resume map, uh, I mean, fixing your particular skew shape over here, this is actually a bijection. So in fact, um, with this uh, commuting property, you can actually show that this, is, uh, this serves as an isomorphism between these two crystals. So this is an example of what's going on for this particular um, set value tableau, where if uh, you see here, um, F2 moves this 2 to a 3 over here. Uh, and then the 2, 2, 1 in the factors 2 and 3 um, turns into a 2, 1, 1 um, on this end. And um, yeah, that, that's you can sort of check that th uh, these are compatible in that sense. Furthermore, um, with respect to the row hacker insertion, uh, and the, the insertion is kind of, kind of complicated to explain here, but uh, it is uh, well behaved with respect to resume map in the following sense. So if you take a particular straight shape um, set value tableau, and then you apply a resume map, and then for these decreasing factorization, you associate this to a de uh, hacker by word by sort of um, labeling your factors one, two, three, four, and um, sort of uh, tag that on top of your letters like so. And then you perform your row hacker insertion from right to left. So, uh, and you get this sort of um, pairs of tableau P and Q. So what's interesting here is that the tableau Q, which we call the recoiling tableau, that is exactly the same as the tableau T over here. And, and what that means is that um, the uh, crystal that, that you have on, on these decreasing factorization, they operate locally, as what we've seen before. That is basically preserved under this row hacker insertion over here. So that, that's quite a, a nice uh, side result. Um, furthermore, we also have um, sort of an insertion uh, that sort of relates the crystal on um, decreasing factorization, the star crystal, with um, the crystal on uh, semi-centered Young tableau as the following manner. So it is through this sort of insertion known as a star insertion. Uh, what it does is that you start with a decreasing factorization. You again uh, tag the factors on top, one, two, three, in, in this particular order, and you insert from right to left. Okay. And uh, if you're familiar with RSK, uh, that is essentially RSK, um, except there's a twist. Uh, but, but to sort of give you an idea of uh, what's going on, um, so what you do is you, you start from the right and then you recursively add um, elements uh, into a particular row. So um, the row that they were talking about is uh, depicted on the top. So in your row R, when, when you want to add X, uh, try to append it, that is, if X is, um, if X is greater than the maximum of R or R is empty. In that case, you stop and then you record the the factor where it comes from um, below over here. Um, otherwise, you then uh, come into these two cases. Either your letter X is in your row R or not. If it's not, then search for the smallest Z that is at least, uh, that is greater than X, um, bump it out as in uh, replace the Z in that row with the X and insert Z into the next row and continue this process, okay? Um, otherwise, if your X is in um, your row R, then it does this um, sort of interesting move where it looks for the longest consecutive interval um, going down, okay, uh, until you hit Y, and you do nothing to that row R, but then you insert instead Y into the uh, next rows and you continue. So eventually you, you have to terminate after you've done uh, all these insertion. So in, in this particular case, um, for 424231, uh, if we start from right to left, we first insert these two boxes, uh, one and record with one. With a three below, we tack it on to the 
right, and we record a one. Now with this two, the two bumps this three out because uh, two is less than uh, three, and that's the smallest number that is greater than two. And uh, the three is then added to the second row. Okay, and then you sort of record the two and so on. Um, the interesting thing where you do uh, case three over here is where um, you add in the two, I believe, over here. And then what happens is that two now goes all the way down to one. And uh, you don't change this row, but you insert a one uh, next and the one bumps the three. And this is where uh, you sort of grow into this tableau. And the last one, well, four, you sort of, um, that, that's the longest consecutive interval. Four is then um, added to the next row and then it is appended at the end of the second row. And so that's how it, how it works. So this is roughly speaking uh, what science insertion does. And the nice thing is that um, this insertion is actually a bijection from um, the self decreasing factorization into m factors to pairs of uh, tableau p and q, uh, p star and q star, such that p star is conjugate semi-standard and q star is semi-standard. And uh, sort of the row reading word that is, if you sort of read your letters from uh, top to bottom in French notation uh, and from left to right, uh, the, the word that you get is a fully commutative word in the zero hexagonoid. And moreover, uh, we actually proved that uh, if you start with a decreasing factorization, you can have uh, an isomorphism into uh, the crystal on semi-standard Young tableau by first performing a star insertion, and then you restrict to the Q tableau. Um, so this actually over here is um, supposedly a Q star. But uh, the thing here is that we still have um, that the star insertion in, in some sense intertwines both of these crystal and it also serves as a crystal isomorphism between the star crystal and the crystal on semi standard Young tableau. Um, so yeah, now uh, we come to the, the last interesting part of, um, of uh, our crystal and this sort of relates to the uncrowding map. So th this was defined by various authors. Um, I think book sort of gave that, but as a, in, as a sketch of a proof, Banner and Morse sort of uh, define it using um, dilation operators and they have a recording tableau which, which is nicely called an elegant filling. And Rainer, Tanner and Young also use that uh, uh, in, in their investigation for set value tableau. So um, how does the uncrowding operator works? Basically it's sort of social distancing, but for set value tableau. <laughs> so uh, what, what you do is um, in your um, set value tableau of skew shape, you look at the cell with, um, well, with more than one entry, we call that a multi-cell. And then uh, for that particular row that contains a multi-cell, look for the largest letter, okay? Let's call it X. Now what you do is then uh, perform RSK bumping into the rows above. So in this particular case, um, the five is identified and then it's inserted to the next row. And then we repeat um, and four, uh, we, we take it and bump it to the next row, four bumps the five, five goes up and so on. So eventually after you repeat all these, um, one step of this is called an, un, uh, is the result of the uncrowding operation. And the entire step is uh, part of what is called the uncrowding map. And of course, if you want a recording tableau, you can also um, sort of take a, a skew shape tableau where you have this um, inner shape and then uh, every time when you introduce a new box, you sort of remember uh, where it came from by sort of recording the difference between the two row indices that uh, it comes from and the, the one that it goes to. Um, but I'm not going, going to go so much into that because uh, we are more interested with the uncrowding result. And the nice thing is that um, we, we have a general setting for skew shape, but at least for straight shape, uh, if you take a particular straight shape tableau uh, with uh, set value entries um, and then you do the resume map, you get a decreasing factorization and then you do a star insertion, you get a pair of tableau, okay? Let's call those pair, uh, let's call that pair P star and Q star. 
On the other hand, if you take the same uh, Tableau T and uncrowd it, you get this pair, um, P and Q. Now, uh, the, the nice thing is that the P Tableau over here, the, which is the um, so, uh, insertion Tableau, that's the same as the recording Tableau um, over there. And that, that sort of says that, you know, um, the star insertion and the uncrowding, they sort of um, capture similar sort of information for you. And, and that also has a nice um, sort of relation that, you know, you can relate this um, crystal on um, set value tableau in two different ways. So yeah. Um, so what's next? Um, obviously, I didn't talk about non-fluid commutative decreasing factorizations. Um, we are really currently working on it, but um, so far, it's the main obstruction is um, uh, locality and sort of like finding a, uh, an approach that um, sort of behaves kind of nicely with, as what you see for a star crystal. And then maybe um, one can also sort of generalize the star insertion for these sort of non-fluid commutative decreasing factorizations, or maybe you can sort of consider a different model for that. That could be a thing. Uh, but also um, there are these um, family of polynomials called, uh, I think, uh, weak Grassmannian growth functions. Um, they are actually the generating function for um, these weakly decreasing factorizations, where instead of having uh, either empty or sweetly decreasing sequence, your factors could have weakly decreasing um, sequences. So in that case, um, what are the analogs of um, the results, if at all, that, that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I think that's um, pretty much all I have. This is a nice picture that relates um, the set value tableau with the star crystal. This is um, a good time to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Wenchen. Um, I had a pre-recorded like clap for everyone, but uh, my phone decided to die. Um, so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, this so, is, you're lying. <laughs> no, like literally it's rebooting now because it decided to die. I was like, really? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much, Wenchen. Um, so if people want to clap, if not, uh, are there any questions? Hmm. We'll give it a second because sometimes it takes a while to type. Um, but can you, do you want to explain this picture? What was this one? Oh, um, yeah. Basically, uh, this is a picture of uh, Crystal on this particular uh, set value tableau, all right? You, um, as, uh, as we've seen earlier, um, there's a crystal operator on set value tableau of this particular shape. And then you can sort of um, take the resume map for this and you will send this to a decreasing factorization. So what I'm showing here is that um, indeed, these two crystals are isomorphic as crystals and also as um, labeled directed graphs. Nice. Uh, so I guess the, I don't see any. Yeah, no, I have a one or, question. Is, go for Nanta. So well, you remember your crystal um, model, the motivation, the first motivation was to solve the multiplication problem, the constant. Yeah. So any uh, headway that way? Because um, here you're, uh, my feeling is that you are doing the, the expansion ensure, not yeah. the, the multiplication, right? That's true, that's true. Um, right now, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how to solve, like directly go into that area yet. Um, because one technically needs like a uh, crystal salt that sort of um, uh, captures all these um, crystal together, yeah. You would like to, yeah. if you have a connected graph, you're happier because then you dis, you you decompose into connected component. But here, it's already disconnected, so that's why I'm. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. If, if there is like some sort of way to sort of connect all these um, components together, maybe on the on the elements on the top, which are the so-called highest weight elements, yeah, then maybe there is some hope to solve. Um, uh, find like a 
nice way to discover what the constants are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for the question. And what were the conditions on your P star tableau? Is there something that characterizes them? Ah, oh, um, so you just want it to be conjugate semi-standard and that the real reading word, that is uh, the word that you get from reading from top to bottom um, to be a fully commutative word in your Zurich line. Okay, and then so, and um, so these are in bijection with, with what objects? With um, the decreasing factorizations that are fully commutative. We, we don't have a description for non-fully commutative yet, so that's why it's this restrictive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, we'll thank the speaker again. Um. <laughs> nice. Good timing this time. Bam. And this time, like, my phone worked. I was like, finally. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll next... stop the recording? Yeah, we can stop the recording. Uh, where do I do that? Oh, here, stop recording. Uh, so next.